My name is Jared Cohen. I'm the director of the Scott Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, distinguished lecture today. We're very pleased that we have with us today the Assistant Secretary of uh, DOE, uh, Christopher Smith. Uh, Chris was, uh, attended West Point, the Military Academy of America, um, and after serving in the Army as an officer, he then went on to a career in the private sector. Along the way, he earned a Master's in Business Administration from Cambridge University in, in the UK. His uh, private sector career has sort of had two halves, one in the financial services sector, uh, where he worked for both Citibank and J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, both in uh, New York and London, and then in the energy sector, which he joined later, working for two major oil companies, the last of which was Chevron. He joined uh, DOE and entered public service in 2009, after that career in the private sector, assuming uh, leadership roles within uh, Energy Department uh, with ever-increasing responsibility, culminating in his nomination in November 2013 to be Assistant Secretary in his current job. Um, he was confirmed by the U.S. Senate in December 2014 and has been serving as Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy ever since. Now, uh, a couple of notes. You may think that it's a long time to be nominated before being confirmed, about a year. You'd be right, but that's America today. And getting confirmed at all uh, these days is a major accomplishment. And you might think that serving two years as the confirmed Assistant Secretary of Fossil Energy, uh, or three years uh, since nomination is a short time, you'd be wrong. Assistant Secretaries of Fossil Energy are about the shortest lived <laughs> creatures in the uh, federal government. It's amazing that Chris has served this long. It's a tribute to both his persistence and his skill that he uh, has been in the position that long and still is. I've uh, made a special request to <laughs> Chris uh, knowing that we would have many students in the audience, I asked him uh, to add to his talk uh, at the very beginning a discussion of his own journey, uh, what took him from wherever he started to becoming Assistant Secretary in a major leadership position in, in the U.S. government. I know this is something that always interests students, how did you get where you are and how do I get where you are? Um, and uh, Chris has agreed to do that. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Assistant Secretary Christopher Smith. Chris? Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and use the, the mic. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. So, uh, so thank, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, for that, that very kind, kind introduction. And uh, uh, Dr. Cohen actually served as the, the co-chair of a committee that overlooks the efficacy of our national laboratories and, and made some recommendations about how we we improve uh, the department in general and, and some of our operations in fossil energy in, in specific. So um, we have a relationship not only through, 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 through that, that forum, but also uh, between the National Energy Technology Laboratory, which I'll talk about, and much of the work that happens here at, uh, at Car Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so again, thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here. Um, I, I assume that most people get their full recommended daily allowance of PowerPoint slides you know, before uh, you know that you get here, so uh, this will be slide three. I'm just going to talk to you for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll see if this is a, a shy crowd. If you got some questions, and that that tends to be the most interesting part for me, and, and sometimes if you're lucky for you, is as, as well the, the back and forth and, and questions. Um, so I'll, I'll actually talk a little bit about the office and about kind of my my path to this uh, to to this job. That's actually been a really interesting opportunity, uh, and then then talk about a couple themes that that, that might be of interest to the, to this group. And I know we've got various disciplines here, various backgrounds, uh, but try to tie some of the work that we're doing with things that are happening in the world, uh, with the transition of the administration coming up, and but also with the important interaction between government and academia, something that builds a lot of our of our, of our capability. So um, first, I, so my name is Christopher Smith. I'm the Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, we are primarily. Uh, a technology organization, that's the heart of, of what we do. Uh, within DOE, there's four applied offices. There's Office of Nuclear Energy, the Office of, uh, of Electricity that 
deals with the grid and stability of the grid. Um, EERE was just energy efficiency and rene renewable energy, so that's wind and solar and enhanced geothermal and biofuels and batteries and transportation and, uh, and efficiency systems, so that's EERE. And then my program is Alpha Fossil Energy. So the Office of Fossil Energy has uh, two major R&D parts. Uh, one is um, sustainability, environmental sustainability and safety of production systems for oil and natural gas. So it's everything from uh, deep water oil and gas production all the way through uh, issues of sustainability for onshore uh, production, uh, primarily shale gas, uh, looking at how do fractures propagate, how do you look at cementing and casing standards, how do you look at well bore stability, how do you reduce surface impacts of shale gas development and shale oil development, um, how you look at issues of induced seismicity, so is issues of making sure that, that that's safe, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, we also have the Office of Clean Coal that looks at uh, carbon capture and sequestration. That's the largest part of our research budget. Uh, that has to deal with lowering the environmental impact, the greenhouse gases that come out of uh, utilizing, primarily utilizing coal for, for power generation, but also looking at uh, industrial sources like cement, pla uh, cement factories and steel plants, uh, chemical plants, um, um, refineries, other industrial sources. Um, and eventually, reducing greenhouse gas emissions that come out of natural gas-fired plants as, as well. So those are two research missions. Uh, we also have the National Energy Technology Laboratory that's based right here in, 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 uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with offices in Morgantown, West Virginia, and a research facility out in Albany, Oregon that focuses on materials. Uh, and lastly, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is four sites in the Gulf of Mexico, two in Texas, and two in Louisiana, that store about 700 million barrels of crude oil, uh, to protect our U.S. economy in the case of some sort of uh, discontinuity in supply of oil that would impact our ability to do the things we need to do here in the United States. So the idea is to have some oil here that we can put right into our own refineries, but also to address um, global price spikes should there be some sort of emergency. Um, so that's what I do. So that's the, the organization that I've had the pleasure of, of running for the last, uh, uh, the last few years. So, you know, how I'll talk a little bit about kind of my, my path to this job and then, uh, you know, segue to kind of what we see being the, the future of the organization uh, generally and how we see fossil energy fitting into the clean uh, energy economy of the future. Uh, so I, I grew up in Texas. I must, you always have some Texans in the room. You must have some Texans here. Uh, there, there we got at least one in the front row, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I actually, uh, I, went to, I went to junior college for a year out of high school. I went to a place called New Mexico Military Institute in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, where I spent a year uh, before going on to the United States Military Academy at West Point. So I was an Army officer for uh, a few years. I studied mechanical engineering and engineering management at, at West Point. Uh, served in the military, got out of the military and worked for, for banks for a couple of years. Um, started in New York and, and went to London. Um, stayed in the UK to go to business school. And then at that point wanted a change in careers. You know, I enjoyed financial uh, markets and I was kind of doing that stuff in a, an interesting time because that was the uh, kind of the mid-90s. Mid uh, but kind of wanted a job where I could actually build stuff and put my hands on things and spent less time you know, looking at, at a, you know, trading indices on a, on a screen. So I ended up in the oil and gas industry. Uh, started in, uh, in Venezuela, came to Houston briefly, and then spent uh, a few years in Bogota, Colombia, uh, where I got to do a couple of interesting things. Uh, negotiated some cross-border uh, pipeline deals between Colombia and Venezuela, the, uh, the, first, uh, you know, the first between those two countries. And, um, uh, extended our offshore leases. So Chevron at the time produced offshore in Colombia and had an opportunity to negotiate the extension of those, of those contracts with the, uh, with the government. Um, I, I ended up coming into this administration. I, 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 I took a leave of absence from Chevron for uh, a few months during the, actually during the Democratic primary back in 2008 to work for the Obama campaign. Uh, did that for a while, came back to my job, and then uh, had the opportunity to come to Washington, D.C. and in my first role in government, which was as the Deputy Assistant Secretary running the oil and gas portfolio, and subsequently ended up in, in the job that I'm in right now. So um, that's a weird path, if uh, you follow that. that uh, I'd like to say as a, as, a, you know, as a college freshman that I charted that out, that I would end up as, 
as uh, in this job. Uh, but I can say that certainly, you know, when I was in college, I, I, I didn't know anything about government. I didn't know what assistant secretary was. I didn't know what the Department of Energy was. Um, uh, so this was not part of any kind of grand plan on, on, my, on my part. But I did have the, you know, you know, I had some good luck. You know, I had some opportunities to do some interesting things. Uh, but also, you know, I was in a position where I could always focus on doing well the thing that was in front of me. And when you do that, it kind of creates, it actually creates some good luck for you. Because when something fortuitously comes up that you have an opportunity to do, you can leap from one thing to the other and you, you kind of build those, those skill sets. Uh, so I, I remember thinking when I was in college, well, you know, you know what am I, what am I going to do? Where am I, where am I headed? And that, that would always cause me some anxiety, particularly as a, as an, as an army officer, because you're supposed to have a path as an army officer, and it's, and it's all, it's all, laid out for you. And when you know, I, much of what I got in terms of how I think about leadership and think how I think about running organizations, I came came from when I was a 23 year old lieutenant. You know, after I graduated from West Point, uh, so that was a formative experience for me. But one that I, you know, obviously I did not stay in the military. I, I said, well, that's the, that's not what I'm going to spend the next 20 years doing. But that experience and all the experiences that, that came after it were the things that allowed me to, to, you know, you know, to do some of the things I've been able to do and, and that I harness and I use every day as I think about the various leadership challenges that, that, uh, that I've had the, the privilege to, to address. And I'll come back to that at the very end because um, I do want to talk a little bit about public service, you know, about some of the things that I've learned in this job. Um, you know, I'll I'll just open or a teaser by saying, you know, when I was at I was you know I was at Chevron before I came to, to Washington D.C. and I was, you know, I'd, I'd had some interactions with government. Um, I was, you know, like most people, um, you know, had a general level of frustration about anything kind of bureaucratic or anything government related. And, and when I when I got the opportunity to be nominated for the job that I came to Washington D.C. for, him, I said. You know, this is just what DC needs. They need a smart guy like me with some prior sector experience to come and fix all these problems. And and when you show up, you realize that like this stuff is really, really hard. I mean, it's it's harder than you expect. They expect it to be. You, you you it takes a while to figure out. You know how you take on these challenges. Uh, when I was in the private sector, I had one boss, and that was a shareholder. If you made money, you got rewarded. If you didn't make money. Maybe got another chance, but not too many. But things are very linear in the in the private sector. Uh, in the public sector, I have like you're all my boss, right? And I've got a thousand bosses, and you get pulled in a lot of different directions on all the issues that you have to deal with, you know, from safety to production to job creation to to climate, and you're accountable to everybody. I mean, that's how it works. And you're not just accountable to your, you know, to your your narrow chain of command or, or your bosses, you're accountable to the, the, US, the, the US public as a public servant. And that's what I do now, and that's why I've stayed so long, that's why I've, I've stuck around in this job, and that's kind, of, that's kind of what I do now, and hopefully some of you guys will decide that might be what, what you want to do, because it's a, it's a terrific opportunity. But um, I, a couple things I want to talk about um, uh, in terms of energy and how we think about this emerging clean energy economy that we're, we're moving into. So when I came in, it, it's hard to overstate the, the degree to which things have changed over the past few years uh, in terms of how we think about energy. So when I came to DOE back in 2009, it was, it was, it was before Deepwater Horizon occurred in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it was before shale gas changed the way we think about natural gas. It was before issues of natural gas exports, because we never thought we'd ever be exporting natural gas, it was before issues of crude exports. It was before trans-border issues like Keystone Pipeline uh, came in and became uh, important and topical. It was before the Fukushima Daiichi disaster in, in Japan, which roiled global LNG markets as uh, suddenly the nuclear power wasn't available in, Jam in Japan anymore. Uh, it was before the Russian incursion into Ukraine turned natural gas markets upside down in, in Europe. Um, all of these things are new. Like none of these topics existed as topics back in 2009. Uh, so things really have changed very, very dramatically in, in a relatively short period of time. And it is, 
kind of strongly impacted the way that we think about our mission, the way we think about energy security, the way we think about job creation, the way we think about uh, how we fit in the global economy in terms of how we use energy um, and how we use it to, uh, to build our economy. So these things are, are new, it's a moving playing field, and it's been an interesting challenge uh, to keep up with these emerging events as we think about our technology portfolio, but also think about the important policy decisions that we have to make that, that, drive, that, drive, uh, that drive the department to, to drive our policy mission. So I was, um, I was the federal official for the commission that uh, President Obama created that looked at the root causes for the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico when that, that BP rig went down in, in Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. Um, that was, you know, it's, you know, in hindsight, it, it's interesting to think about that, but it's, uh, it's hard to overstate the, the degree of uncertainty that we were all dealing with in the time when that disaster was ongoing. And the, the, the job of the commission, we, we weren't remediating anything, but the job of the commission was to look at root causes and figure out what went wrong. And our job was to figure out what went wrong while things were still going wrong, because the, the, the well was still blowing out when the commission was formed. And we had that unique challenge of trying to piece through all of those root causes. And that's a, that in itself is, is, a, is a long discussion. But you know, as, as a means of comparison, so I'll, I'll, I'll you know, one of the first things we did with the Deepwater Horizon Commission was we convened a public hearing in New Orleans. So we're in an enormous hotel ballroom uh, packed, and, and, and so you know, take yourself back to 2010. So when the well was blowing out, the entire oil and gas industry in all the Gulf of Mexico was shut down. Everybody was at home, like nothing, no drill bits were turning. All the fisheries were turned out, were, were shut down. All the hotels were, were shut down. Um, you know, the, all of the industrial processes that, that, that feed into those activities were also shut down. I mean, people were sitting at home, and you'd turn on your television, and you would go to CNN, and you would see a live feed of that pipe sitting in 5,000 feet of water just belching hydrocarbons into the Gulf of Mexico. And at the time, there was, there was nothing that existed to fix that. Like, the, the thing that they used to fix it eventually didn't exist. It hadn't been in, invented, right? There was no capping stack put on that well. Um, the BOP was instrumented in such a way that you couldn't tell what was happening inside the BOP. You didn't know if the, the blowout preventer, the, the device, the fail-safe device that failed. Um, you couldn't tell what was going on inside of it. You know, we didn't know anything about what was going on beneath the mud line so that if you were able to cap the well to understand what would happen to that well bore beneath the mud line, it, we, no one knew, right? Um, so there was a lot of uncertainty in that, in that environment. And so you know, I, I take myself back to that public hearing we did. So auditorium full of people in an environment in which the entire economic livelihood of the region was on hold indefinitely. And so, you know, two microphones set up and uh, people would come up and, and say, well, here's what I'm concerned about. And the idea was to get input from the public as we think about the, the process of, of how, we, how we go forward. So very, very difficult hearing, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, very tense. Uh, in the end, there was a solution that, that did oper that work. We're still understanding kind of impacts of the marine environment. But, um, you know, lots of lessons learned there. But, you know, it's like imagine, that scene in that hearing. So fast forward a couple of years after that. We did a very similar hearing uh, for a, uh, a group that was convened by the Sector of Energy's advisory board that we did here in, in just out, out in the outskirts of, of Pittsburgh, here in Pennsylvania. And it was the same setup, a bunch of people on, on, on the stage. I was the federal official, uh, auditorium full of concerned citizens. And the topic this time was shell gas and hydraulic fracturing. So this was in, have you guys familiar with Gasland, the, the video that, or the documentary that came out about impacts of shale gas and dangers to drinking water and, and the air that we breathe. So that's when, you know, that was in full flight and people were really very concerned, as they still are to some extent about the, extent about the, the issues of, of shale gas. So same setup, uh, auditorium full of people, two microphones so people could come and say, well, here's what it is that I'm concerned about in terms of shale gas. And, but this is an environment in which there is no ongoing ecological environmental disaster. There's no well blowing out. Um, you know, there's no, you know, people aren't out of work, uh, but people are concerned because these wells are where, they, where you live. You know. 
And if I compare those two hearings, the hearing that we did in Pennsylvania on shell gas was twice as difficult, as acrimonious, as sharp elbowed, as the hearing that we did in the Gulf of Mexico when we had an ongoing ecological disaster of unprecedented scale. Um, industry had bust in bust loads of people to be like the pro shell gas, drill baby drill folks, right, who had t-shirts and whole nine yards. Environmental groups had bust in bust loads of people to be the, you know, no fracking, you know, with the slash, right, um, t-shirts and signs and you know, noise. And so whenever someone would come up to the, to the, to the, to the microphone, uh, just this din of noise, and everybody had to get quiet just long enough so if I could figure out, is that, is that my guy or, or their guy, right? <laughs> and so once you've you identified if they're on your side or not, then you could resume your, your, your chanting. And every now and then you could look at the person to tell who they were, right? Because they have a tie-dye t-shirt or something, right? But usually you'd have to get quiet enough just, just for a moment to hear what they're saying so that you could then determine how you would react. So that's um, not a useful dialogue, right? That's kind of a simultaneous monologue. It's a bunch of crosstalk. Um, not much of a dialogue. So what do we do in DOE? So our job is to take, you know, you know, we're a technology organization, but technology exists within the government only insofar as it either drives future investments are made by the public sector or helps to put some scientific basis to the policy decisions that we make. Right? So our job is to take the concerns that one might have about shell gas, about hydraulic fracturing. Well, how do fractures propagate? You know, how do you keep drinking water safe? You know, how much methane is being released into the air and what might be the impact on human health? Uh, what are the impacts to the watershed? What about surface impacts? What about induced seismicity? Um, what about these earthquakes we're having in, 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 uh, in Oklahoma? And put some science to that so that you can quantify those risks and then you can subsequently make good policy decisions based not on this noisy back and forth that is unuseful, but on, you know, here's what we're learning at the national laboratories. Here's what we're learning at labs. Here's what we're learning in the labs in collaboration with, with institutions like, like Carnegie Mellon. And those dialogues have gotten better. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's easy to, to look at kind of the, uh, you know, somewhat uncivil uh, public political dialogue that you sometimes see and say, well, that's just all a mess and it's, it doesn't work. Uh, but, but I can say, like, my one, my one thing I've gotten out of my experience in, in this job is that there is a lot of tremendously good work going on. There are a lot of things we're learning. Uh, there are a lot of science-based rules that we're putting in place that are impacting our society in a positive way, that they're helping us uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, protect the environment, and create jobs in a way that, that makes our, our country stronger. Uh, there is, there's a lot more you know, positive work going on uh, than, than might be obvious to the, to the, to the external observer. And that's really one of the reasons why this has been a fun place to work for the last uh, last seven years and, and why I've kind of stuck around in, in, in this job. So now we're thinking about, you know, there's, there's an election kind of going on, right? Um, we'll, you know, that, that will conclude on the, the 8th of, of November and we'll have a new transition team and we'll be transitioning into the next administration. So we're now into the, the position now of thinking about, well, how will that transition look? Um, what will be the last budget that this president puts together? Uh, that will be then enacted by the, the subsequent president. And how do we think strategically about the role of fossil energy in the future and how we think about job creation and energy security and, and, and the environment? Like, what's the plan going forward? So it's actually a real interesting time now to take this runway behind us, all the things we've learned, and, and figure out what's the trajectory into the future. So I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of comments on that, and I'll put that into the context of of, um, of COP21, the global climate uh, negotiation that occurred in November of last year in Paris. So in these, uh, in these global climate discussions, uh, you know, you know, first of all, you know, the issue of climate is, is a classically difficult issue for governments to address. Uh, it's existential in importance. It's relatively slow moving. So the things that there's always some other 
thing that will grab one's eye, right? Uh, that might feel more urgent, but truly, you know, never more important. Um, you have to collaborate. We, we can't, if we, if we did everything that we could here in the United States, we did it by ourselves, it would do no good. Um, you know, a molecule of CO2 or a molecule of any greenhouse warming gas doesn't care about where it was emitted. You know, this truly is a global, a global challenge. So a classically difficult problem for, for governments to address, but one that, ha that has, you know, is, is fundamentally a government role. So our, our goal going into COP21, when all these nations come together, was you know, initially that we thought maybe 50, maybe 60 countries would put forth what's called an INDC, an initial nationally determined contribution. That's the specific plan that a government or country plans to take in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think that was the general aspiration, and you know the thought was that you know in this global negotiation that there'd be lots of meetings and side meetings, and you'd negotiate with your peers and your allies and trading partners, and try to get companies to countries to step up and say, oh, "This is my plan." So going into COP 21, the United States had already announced its INDC, its Initial National Determined Contribution, as had had China, kind of in a, in a coordinated way, and. As the two largest economies, the two largest consumers, the two largest producers, and the two largest emitters, uh, what the United States and what China does, you know, what they do together, is certainly very, very important for the world. But that U.S. leadership um, that was really spearheaded by, by this administration set the tone for, for COP21. And so the, the outcome of COP21 wasn't 50 or 60 countries, it was 190 countries, 190 countries put forth a specific plan to address greenhouse gas emissions, to address anthropogenic CO2 and other greenhouse gases that are impacting our, our, our climate. You know, 190 countries. Um, it's hard to get 190 countries to agree to anything, right? Much less agree to doing something that, that's difficult, that, that costs money, that requires effort, but which we have to do together in order to make sure that we've got a shared future. Uh, so that was Truly, I think one of the you know one of the most important uh, uh, accomplishments that the department's been able to to contribute to um, over the course of, of the last eight years. Uh, but now we're into the implementation phase, right? Because you know the devil's in the details. Uh, the you know you've got the commitment, but what do you, how do you turn that commitment to an action that is that's verifiable and, is, that, and that that is coordinated? And that's where we that's where we are now. Uh, a couple of observations. Uh, first. If, even if all 190 countries did everything that they, that they committed to, that still doesn't get you to your goal. When you put that in the climate models, when we look at you know, what's the impact of, of, of all these INDCs, um, it's, it's, it's still not, it's a lot. It's a, it's a tremendously uh, important outcome and, and I think a big success, but it's still not enough. And the observation there is that COP21 isn't the end, it's not the solution. It's really the, it's the start, it's the, it's the commitment, and it's the platform upon which we're going to innovate, that you're gonna create, uh, you're gonna create the future. Because there are things that we haven't imagined yet. Right? There are things that we haven't discovered yet. There are things that you haven't discovered yet here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, they're gonna contribute to our being able to get to the, the levels of emissions that we need to get to in order to, to get to, uh, to a, a stable climate. The second thing I'll, I'll mention is that there are a couple of, of other things that came out of, out of, of, COP, out of uh, uh, COP21. Uh, the first was uh, a, a, a group called Mission Innovation, or initiative called Mission Innovation. And so that's about 20 countries that made the dedication to double their public sector research and development in clean energy technologies over the next five years. So a doubling in clean energy technologies over the next five years. And the United States is a very big part of that, and the program that I lead is, is a part of the United States' commitment. Uh, the second is uh, a group called the Breakthrough Initiative, which is a group of high net worth individuals who have committed to matching those mission innovation dollars in a private fund that will invest in clean energy focused technology development in those countries that are part of mission innovation. And so an early commitment to ensure that there is some private sector capital that's committed to clean energy technologies and that also has the patience to 
invest in technologies that will, will take the time that's required in order to be, uh, in order to be uh, uh, implemented. Uh, so two important things that, that came out of, out of, uh, out of COP21. So we think the United States can have an important role in this mission. I mean, going forward, you can envision two types of countries in the carbon-constrained world of the future. You can have you know, those countries that, that build, that invest, that innovate, that create, uh, that come up with the technological solutions of the future. And then you're going to have those other countries that, that buy those things from countries in the first category. So uh, we do really, truly believe that the United States has pole position in a lot of these things. Um, I've, I've, had a, you know, I've had a really interesting day here talking to uh, many of the faculty here uh, associated with the Energy Center here at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and there are tremendous things that we're doing uh, together. The interaction between uh, the, the public sector government and academia is, is, is a, a critical source of innovation for us thinking about getting ideas taken from the bench stop all the way through demonstration and creating an environment in which the private sector can come and make investments based on those, on those innovations. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll mention before I, I open the floor up to see if there are any, any questions is that, um, uh, you know, my experience as a, as a public servant has been a really, you know, really rewarding one. Um, I've, you know, so when I came to the Department of Energy back in 2009, you know, as I mentioned in my, in my opening comments, um, it, there's a whole education you go through in terms of how you make this thing work, um, um, how you deal with a very uh, diverse stakeholders, all of whom are part of the United States uh, society and all are very important to us. Um, I've, I've had an opportunity to testify before Congress on 16 separate occasions as administration witness uh, before the House and the Senate. Um, sometimes that's fun, sometimes that's, that's less fun. Right? Uh, but it's, um, it's an important part of what we do. Um, that's an important part of the relationship between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And keeping that communication open and rigorous and hopefully you know, science-based helps us to collectively make good decisions. Uh, so when I think about my job, like I don't, I don't turn the drill bit, I don't run any computer models, I don't develop anything. I mean, I'm not a practicing scientist. I run a science organization, uh, but I don't do any of that work. We've got a tremendous, tremendous group of folks who are really leaning hard into a very, very difficult mission. And, and many of you have, 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 have worked with a lot of folks here at NET, NETL, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, which is part of our organization, uh, is based right here in Pittsburgh and does lots of work here with Car Carnegie Mellon. Um, it's, just, it's just a terrific bunch of people to work with. Um, it's, it's inspiring for me to come to work every day. And again, one of the reasons I've stayed in this job, you know, as long as I have, is that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be part of a mission that's kind of bigger than you are, that's bigger than any company is. I mean, I, 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 I really enjoyed my, Chevron, my time at Chevron, and, and I learned a lot from it, and I took those processes and, 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 and learnings, to, and I apply it to my job every day, same as my, 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 my time at Citibank and J.P. Morgan. Uh, but being part of a mission where, you know, if, you know, a, a failure, if, if I don't get something done, if, if I, you know, if, if things don't work, I really care about it because I'm working on something that's really important. I mean, when I was in the private sector, I mean, I, I cared about successes and failures, but, you know, if you had a project that failed, it's like, oh, well, that didn't work, and they have to go do something else to make money for the company, right? Um, here, you know, if we're working on issues of, of technology development or, or climate or environmental sustainability or safety, and, you, and, and you, you, you don't get something done, it has an impact. It has an impact on our country. It has an impact on our, on our lives and how we think about energy security. It's, you know, I, I go to bed every night and get up every morning thinking about the, the importance of the, of the mission. And that's, for me, been a really fun thing to be part of. And you know, as, as you guys think about your path forward, you know, you're here at you know, one of the prestigious science universities of the world. You, you've got opportunities to do a lot of tremendous stuff. You know, maybe not many of you are thinking about coming and working for the government. Um, but it's a terrific place to be. And now, now is an exciting time to be working for, for on, on issues of technology and energy and policy. 
Like that nexus of things is really at the center of a lot of what we think about in terms of, of making our society work and making our, our country strong. So um, perhaps as you're thinking about your path forward, some of you guys will think about, well, maybe being a public servant, something that I'd be, that I'd be interested in. Um, with that, you know, perhaps I'll, I'll pause. Um, you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here. So, had we known about your experience, we would have arranged two microphones on your head. Yeah, yeah. Your side <laughs> I, I would have run out the door, right? You know? yeah. <laughs> um, so, it's very nice that Assistant Secretary Smith has agreed to entertain your questions since I grabbed the floor before anybody else could. Let me ask a question. All right. Okay. Um, I, I love what you just said at the end about public service and how that motivates you and being part of something bigger than you. And uh, part of the mission that you don't believe in. But that's sort of in retrospect, seven years after you decided to do it. Right. Uh, it's a really interesting thing to think about someone being successful in a company like Chevron making this big change in the public sector. So the question is, why did you do that? It sounded, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but it sounded like President Obama's uh, campaign excited you, attracted your attention. Was it that that motivated you, that inspired you to go into public service, or what was it? I mean, I think it was, it was a combination of things. Um, uh, that was certainly the initial thing, that um, you know, I, I, wanted to come and, I wanted to come and work for this administration. But that's not what kept me. I mean, if, if that was it, I would have come, you know, done something for a couple of years, and I would have gone back to the private sector and said, well, you know, I got to work for the Obama administration. So, uh, but that was, that was perhaps the hook for me. And uh, again, I, I think my, my appreciation not only for the mission, but also for the people I get to work with every day, um, that's the thing that's kind of, that's kind of kept me. So, uh, you know, that was the, the, uh, the initial hook. But, um, you know, I've also, you know, as I've been there, I've, I've, I've become really interested in, in, you know, from a managerial side and a cultural side, you know, how do we take these institutions and, and make them better? And um, it's and this is kind of this is something that's kind of surprised me about myself. But I, I didn't I didn't think I would I didn't expect to like being a bureaucrat, um, which is like a funny thing to think about now. But you know, people like no one loves bureaucracy. Like no one loves going to the post office or going to return something that didn't fit or, or being put on hold when you. I mean, no one loves dealing with a bureaucracy. Like no one loves you know dealing with the IRS when you have to pay your taxes. But like these are, like bureaucracies are a necessary part of societies in which people have to work together. Um, you know, this university has a bureaucracy, right? I'm sure you love dealing with it, right? But um, I mean, it's 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 the, it's the it's the connective tissue of, of our society, and and you can make them better, right? There is a there is an important and noble work of taking bureaucracies and making them better. About thinking about how to make processes better, thinking about how do you how do you serve your employees better? Like how do you make something more streamlined? How do you take an organization that is that is is you know has real has great bones, has great potential, and turn it into something that's going to be the organization of the future? And that's been a surprisingly fun thing. It's also something that takes a lot more patience than you realize. I mean, I you come up with a bunch of ideas and and it takes time to execute anything. Um, you know, when I came to government again, you know, I was like, hey, I'm I'm here to save the Office of Fossil, Office of Fossil Energy, and, and you pretty quickly realize it was like being, it was like being a 23-year-old platoon leader all over again. So when I graduated from West Point, I had my degree, I felt like I was a pretty smart guy. You get to your unit, and you, you don't know anything about running an army platoon, right? I've been in, I came from college, right? I, I wasn't a soldier. And you got a platoon sergeant who actually does know about running the platoon. Now, I did know about a lot of stuff, I mean, I was super useful. I think I was a, I was a, good, a good army officer. But part of that leadership challenge is knowing what you know and embracing that and employing it and not being bashful about what you don't know. Because I mean, one thing I'll, I'll, you know, I'll mention to all of you guys who will be going into new, new jobs and new opportunities. When you go into a job, you, you, first of all, you, you don't, you, a, a lot of people as you go into new opportunities, you, have to, you feel like you have to show everybody that you're smart. Like, like I'm, you have to do things so that you're smart. 
And general age is particularly for you guys coming out of this organization, right? People will look at the piece of paper that has your name and your stuff on it, and they'll say, okay, you already had, you already, people already checked the smart box, so you don't have to do anything to prove you're smart. So forget about that, right? So you, you can talk a little bit less, right? And, and also, you, you, when you go into an organization, you will be ignorant about the organization. Like there will be things, basic things you don't know. And a lot of people when they come into a new job, they feel like they, they have to hide their ignorance. Like they have to pretend they know everything. Um, everybody, everybody already knows you don't know anything, right? You just got there, and that's okay. Like when I came to my job, I didn't know anything about outrunning the Office of Fossil Energy. And I didn't have to spend a few months trying to pretend like I did. In fact, I, I asked every dumb question there was because it was okay, right? Now, if, if, you, if you follow both of those things, if you, if, you don't have to, if you don't feel like you have to prove that you're smart and you don't have to try to hide your ignorance, in those first few months, you can learn a lot, right? Because you can ask all those questions, uh, you can actually get good at your job. The flip side is if, if you don't use that free period, because that free period will run out, right? People will forget that you're new before you're actually not new, right? So that, that free card will, will, will expire. If you don't use it when you first get there, it, it's gone. You're like, oh, well, I can't ask these questions anymore because people have forgotten that I'm still new. Um, so that's, that's been another I think, thing that's kind of inspired me in terms of in this job is I've gotten to learn something new. And I've had really good people to teach me the things I didn't know. And then I've been there long enough to get good at things where I feel like I can make a little bit of a, of a, of a contribution. And now I'm getting thrown out, so. so. So I have a question. You uh, started your presentation by pointing out all the changes that have occurred in the last six, seven years in energy that were not predicted by anybody. Well, not by me anyway, right? Yeah. No, you're, you're okay with that, right? right? Yeah. So what does the government the administration do? How does it approach that basic problem of trying to predict the future and see what's coming down towards us before it becomes too late? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's an enormous question, right? So um, I'll give you kind of a narrow answer then a slightly more broad one. So in terms of our portfolio, uh, portfolio, you know, for example, <clears throat> like we get hit, we get impacted a lot by commodity prices. So you look at oil prices. In 1998, oil was at WTI was 13 bucks. 2008, it was $140. A couple years ago, it was down to 20 something. You know, now we're like 40, 50. I mean, it's an incredibly volatile commodity. And natural gas prices all over the place as well. So we're developing wind and solar and enhanced geothermal and um, you know, biofuels and, and nuclear. And you know, when you're in these price fluctuations, people will say, well, shouldn't you, you know, when your price is down here, it looks like, well, why do you need all this wind and solar, right? You know, I, or how are you gonna compete you know, against these lower, these low price commodities? Um, and then when it's up here, you realize, oh, I've got no options and we gotta step on the gas. Well, in terms of being a, a, you know, a technology portfolio, I think we have to have some humility about we don't, we don't know what's gonna happen, right? So we need some continuity in our R&D portfolio. And we have to make sure we're not chasing the commodity curve, that we're not, when prices go up or they go down or this thing happens or that thing happens, that we do hold over, you know, that we hold the, the wheel relatively steady. Now, that doesn't mean you just hold it steady and, and you just drive off the cliff over 30 years, right? I mean, you, do, you, do, you are making course corrections. But your course corrections have to be, well, first of all, you, you don't want them to be too sudden, but you also want to make sure that you are making them, right? That you're thinking about a long-term plan and that you're not chasing the commodity curves, but you are thinking about the challenges of the future. So one of the challenges that I have as running a technology organization is that when we succeed at something, we want to do more of it, right? And here's the ironic thing about being in the government, running R&D, is, you know, for us, a success is when you do something and you succeed and the private sector comes in and says, that's awesome, I'm gonna start building those widgets. And then what that means is you stop doing it, right? So the thing I tell my folks at NETL as we think about, think about our budgets is, the reward for a successful program is you get defunded, right? If you do a real good job, I'm gonna cut your funding because you've worked yourself out of a job. Now, um, um, and I have to say it in slightly different terms than that, but I mean, that's generally, how that, how that kind of works. Now that's not in the 
general DNA as human beings, right? Like we like to continue doing things that we know how to do and they have corporate partners for also. So one of the things that we, I'm not sure we always do a great job of, but we're trying to do is make sure that as situations change and markets change and commercial circumstances change, that we aren't, you know, I said we can't, we don't want to change the portfolio like this based on the, the commodity curve, but we do have to see where the private sector is going. And we, have to, we have to, do have to see where investments are occurring and make sure that we're taking finite public sector dollars and dedicating to them to things that do have a fundamental public sector government mission. Things that have big positive externalities that won't occur unless the government is making the, the investment. And you know, that's one of the challenges of running a, 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 a public R&D portfolio. I saw another hand over here. Go ahead. Um, do you think that, uh, what, what's the lowest amount of fossil fuels that you think the U.S. can end up depending on in the future in terms of yeah. So another, another big question, right? So, you know, our, 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 so I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm the assistant secretary of fossil energy, so that's, that's my portfolio. So I say that to say that, you know, I'm not a fossil energy advocate or a fossil energy opponent, right? My job is to develop technologies and figure out how it fits into our, our overall goal of reducing the greenhouse gas impact of, 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 of all of our energy makeup. So, you know, the, we'll see what the future brings. You know, technology. We don't know what technology is going to going to deliver. There was um, there was an interesting kind of data point that came out. I think this week or last week in in Scotland. That I think for the first time, they had a day or two where the entire power generation for for their whole economy was provided out of off of wind, because they had some unusually you know windy days, and you know you could get to 100 percent. Now that's a that's a data point. It's a blip, and you know that's not sustainable because wind is an intermittent source just like, like solar. Uh, but you know, prices for PV solar have come down dramatically. Uh, we're getting better at wind. Um, we're working on things like you know, you know, small modular nuclear reactors that might make uh, nuclear power uh, more economic. Nuclear is going to be an important part of reaching our, our, our climate goals. Um, so in that we are using fossil, you know, we are, the program that I work on is carbon capture and sequestration. How do you retrofit existing plants so instead of taking all that CO2 and just putting it into the environment, you can capture it and store it permanently in a way that's safe and doesn't impact the, impact the environment. Uh, to get to our goals of a one and a half degree world or a two degree world, uh, to get to our goal of deep, deep decarbonization by, by mid-century, we're going to have to have very, very low, very, very low percentages of uncontrolled fossil, meaning fossil that is, is not augmented by carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, so we know that those levels have to, have to, go, have to go low. Now, 40% of the, the power that we generate right now comes from coal. Uh, so we are using a lot of coal now. And so you know, there, will be, there will be efforts to move us to, you know, and the market will do this, and it is doing this, right? The market is moving us from coal to natural gas and it'll move us from natural gas to something else you know, in the future. Uh, but the market will move us to, to lower, lower carbon sources of, of electricity, of, of energy to, put, to, uh, to produce electricity. But we're also gonna continue to implement technological solutions like carbon capture and sequestration so that the, the, uh, the fossil that we're using does have a dramatically, dramatically lower carbon footprint so that it's on par with other renewable sources. So it's, it's, it's a dodge, right? And so I acknowledge that I'm dodging your question. Because the answer is I don't know. I could have said I don't know and just gone on to the next question. <laughs> but um, uh, because again, it's, it's a question of the path of technologies. And our, our approach is all the above so that we, we have a lot of seed corn out there, a lot of technological options. And we have to water all of them so that we see you know, what has the potential to turn into the, the solution that, that leads to that deep, deep decarbonization by mid-century. That's a, uh, that's so. Yeah. so, how do you handle uh, changes in administration? Like, for example, Mr. Trump says that he would cancel all the COP21 commitments. So, then how would your policy technology change? Right. So, can you repeat the question? I don't think okay, so. yeah. So, the question is with the, the change in administration, you know, um, different candidates have said different things about, they say, uh, canceling COP21 commitment, right? So, how do we think about that? 
Um, so um, I won't speak in too much specificity about you know any particular candidate's uh, statements. Uh, one thing I, I, that, that I can say is that um, you know the outcome of COP21 again was 190 countries making a specific commitment to do a specific thing to address an existent, a program a problem of existential importance. It's it's hard to wind back the clock on that. I mean, that is an emerged international consensus backed by science about the importance of doing something. So I'm, I'm very confident that the things that we've started in this administration in terms of the technological pathway and the regulatory pathway will have legs going forward. Um, that we've got a basis in, in good policy and in, in energy security and in environmental sustainability um, that's consistent with our country's values, with the world's values, and that we'll, we'll continue to make progress on that. Um, again, and so I, again, I, I won't speak too specifically about, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens on uh, going forward and, and what the next administration, what their policies are, so I, I won't speak to them. Uh, but I, I will say that things that we are doing, in the, the, we're, we're endeavoring to make sure that we are making good decisions based on good science and good policy. And we're showing international leadership in this area that, you know, when we went into COP21, the success of that engagement was based on the U.S. the U.S. leading, right? Um, and I, I think that's that's important. That's going to be sustainable. That's okay. That's, I think I saw you first. Um, so you went from like, um, being in like private industry to the public sector. Do you feel like having that experience in industry has helped you in public? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it certainly has helped me a lot. Um, okay, sorry. So the question was, uh, you know, I started in the private sector and I went to the public sector. Did my experience in the, pu in the private sector help me and in industry help me with my job right now? So, you know, an important part of everything we do when you look at developing technologies is an understanding of how a success, how either a success in developing the technology or the impact of a particular policy will impact the way that companies dedicate capital. I mean, that's our lever, right? So it, you put forward a rule, the rule's gonna impact the way that companies spend money that then impacts everything, all right? So an understanding of that pathway, being able to say, well, here's, here's our desired outcome, and being able to connect the desired outcome with a rule and an expected reaction in the private sector that gets you to an outcome, to get you to the final outcome, is, is the pathway that, that helps lead to, to, to good policy creation. So um, I think I did get some insights from the, the, the private sector, because I've been in the situation of having to pitch projects to, you know, to my leadership team within a company to spend money. Uh, so I, I think that, that, that did, did help me. I think also the diversity of experience also was, was useful because you know, bankers think in a certain way, um, industry, oil and gas industry thinks in a certain way. Um, you know, I got certain leadership experience from being a military officer, so I think those things all did kind of help me think about the task. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in that sequence, by the way, right? Because uh, uh, I know, you know folks who start out in government and go into the, the, the private sector have a great insight on, you know, the broader levers of, of how they, the, our society and the world works that helps them be, be effective in, in the private sector. So I think experiences on both sides are, are relevant to, to the other. You mentioned right. that a lot of the positive work that happens in your sector isn't always quite so obvious to the general public. So right. what are some of the more major positive changes that have happened in the past few years? Yeah, so good question. So um, I, I think that, uh, you know, perhaps a cop, I, I talked about COP21 and the fact that we're moving on, on a pathway there, I think, has been very important. Um, I think the research and development <coughs> that we've done around quantifying the issues around shell gas and hydraulic fracturing have helped bring a more science based conversation, which has helped us to, I think, make good decisions. Um, I don't think you make good decisions when people just throw food at each other. Right? Um, they are, you know, we have to take the broad series of, of concerns seriously and, and show that we're using you know, our collective scientific capability to quantify them in a way that shows that we're taking them seriously and we can, we can line up um, a concern with 
a mitigation in the regulations, and we can, we can show that, that that's the case. Um, throughout our entire technology portfolio, I think that we've, we've, we've really made some advances in, in, in a lot of the areas. I mean, if you look at the, the price of PV solar, it's just come down incredibly you know, over, over the last uh, uh, five or six years. So, you know, real, real advance has been made in that area. Um, if you look at, you know, something that's not always obvious, but the, the interaction between uh, the federal government and the states. You know, so you, you look at throughout the, the U.S. Um, this, so when we think about natural gas, for example, you know, we have a national, we, you know, we endeavor to encourage certain levels of gas utilization. We like the job creation. We like the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But, you know, we can't execute that as the federal government because much of that activity is regulated by the states. But we do, or you know, we are actually working together with the states to make sure that the research and development we're doing at NETL, you know, some of it in conjunction here with Carnegie Mellon, is helping to inform state-based regulators. Um, if you looked at the Deepwater Horizon, which was a, you know, a terrible event, um, I think we're able to, you know, the Department of the Interior took one organization which oversaw putting out leases, environmental enforcement and collecting money. So all those three things in one entity, a lot of inherent um, conflicts of interest. Broke that up into three pieces, you know, based on um, uh, a lot of the look back that, 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 that occurred after the Deepwater Horizon. And some of the appropriate research is now going into quantifying some of those risks to make sure that that accident doesn't happen again. So, I mean, and those are things that, that spin off the top of my head, but um, no, when I think to my day, when I think about my day-to-day -day interaction, um, the level of collaboration that I have with um, you know, with industry, you know, with the states, uh, many in in many cases, you know, the collaboration that one would think of maybe being torn by by partisan uh, uh, conflicts, um, there's a lot of good communication going on, and, and those those are a few examples that, that popped in my head. Uh, I think uh, you're in, you're next. Um, so you mentioned that with all the commitments that were made in COP21, we still wouldn't be able to meet the target for two degree, um, for it still, the temperature would still increase by two degrees uh, by 2100. Um, what, what's the next step? What do we need to do next? Yeah, so the question was, you know, I, I made the comment that even, even, if, we'd, even if all the countries, all the 190 uh, initial nationally determined contributions of COP21 were, were met, we still don't get to, to a two degree world. So, so what then, right? So, um, so that's, that's like the enormous question right there. Um, so we know that we do have this innovation platform and that COP21 isn't the end, it's, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of the next step. And so what happens now is that we continue to, to build, to create, to innovate. We continue to, to strengthen our partnerships between government and academia. Uh, we have to lower the costs of, of capture for, for, for carbon capture and sequestration uh, opportunities. We have to continue to innovate on you know, offshore wind, on, on, uh, on solar, on enhanced geothermal. Uh, we have to get the, the, the permitting process for nuclear plants to be uh, effective, uh, cost effective. We have to uh, reduce the, continue to innovate on small modular nuclear reactors. We have to uh, in, in, increase uh, technologies for efficiency. We have to look at biofuels. Eventually, we got to look at uh, solutions to have net reductions in, in carbon. Uh, that you can achieve by you know, mixing biomass with fossil fuels, uh, combusting them to, to create electricity, and then sequestering the, the carbon that comes out of the CO2 that comes out of the back end of that system. So a, a lot of things. So one thing I can't give you is, is a menu and tell you what's, you know, what, what's going to succeed and what's not. But what I do know is that we do have to continue to innovate. And that the United States is going to have a really, really important role in this. And not only is it, a, is it, a, is it an opportunity to ensure we meet our climate goals, but there's an enormous commercial opportunity to developing the technologies for the clean energy environment, of, uh, clean energy economy of the future, um, and that we've got to keep working at it. So it's, uh, that, that's, that's really the, the nature of our, our research challenges uh, going forward. So, um, talking about carbon capture and sequestration, currently we have demonstrations and pilots here and there. Right. So in the coming, say, 20, 30, 50 years, do you think these technologies will be more mainstream? Do yeah. you see more plants being retrofit or installations having these technologies? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the, you know, if, if you look at our budget, so the Office of Fossil Energy, our, you know, if you look at our budget, the majority of the money that we spend is for carbon capture and sequestration. 
Um, so we've got a, a, a few major demonstrations that we're working on here in the United States, and, and I'll, I'll mention one, uh, which is a, a collaboration with uh, a company called NRG, uh, just south of Houston, Texas, in Petronova Parish. So it's a it's a plant that was it's the largest fossil burning plant uh, power plant in the United States that's just south of Houston, Texas, and we're retrofitting that plant to capture you know some of the carbon, some of the CO2 that's coming out of the plant. So when we initially started that project. So it's a project that has, it's partially subsidized by the government, and you know, we, we, we competed it to see who would want it to do it with us, and so NRG won. And so initially it was gonna be a 60 megawatt project. And what NRG is gonna do is, so they own the plant, they're investing in the CO2 capture along with our investment. They're building, they're investing in the pipeline that would take the CO2 out of the plant and take it to an oil field, which they're also investing in, and they're gonna use that CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So they take the CO2, they put it into a depleted oil field, it's sequestered over time, and then that, uh, that CO2 allows you to produce some barrels of oil domestically that otherwise you would have to import from other countries. So that's the business model. So when, when they looked at the plant, when they looked at the project and they did the front end engineering and design, and they looked at the field, so you need a certain amount of CO2 in order to get an effective missile sweep to, to, to get the right type of response out of the field to get those extra barrels out. And they realized that they needed a lot more CO2 than they would get out of 60 megawatts worth of capture. And so they quadrupled the size of the capture project from 60 to 240 megawatts. But at no additional cost to the government, right? Because you know, we, we competed the 60 megawatt project. If they wanted to do a 240 megawatt project, hey, good on you, right? But we don't have any more money, right? So, so, they, so they did that on their own dime, right? And what we're learning from that is if you have one entity that owns a plant that's investing in the, in the post-combustion capture, that's investing in the pipeline, and is also investing in the field, you learn a lot about the business model of how you can pay for the capture using the value of some barrels that otherwise would never have been produced. And you need that right now to get these demos in place because we don't have a price of carbon. Right? If I'm a, if I'm a coal-fired power plant, I can emit as much CO2 into the environment as I want to, and no one sends me a bill for that. Right? It's, it's free. So in that, you know, in, in, in that regulatory environment, it's tough to, to get someone to capture the CO2. Now, the, the idea of the clean power plan is that you know, we will have um, caps on, the, we'll have targets that states have to make, and, and CCS will be, will, be, will, be, will be part of that. Um, but right now, we're showing that these, you know, this is a technology which, that, we, that we understand. Um, in terms of enhanced oil recovery, the economics of the project is dependent on oil prices. So when that, pri when that project was first put in place, we were at, I don't know, I think 80 or $90 oil, which we're not now, right? So, um, so that's not good for the project. Uh, but we do know that the components of the project operate, that we can build these right now. They're being built right now. And the R&D &D that we're doing is gonna continue to push those costs down and down and down. In addition, we're looking at you know, brand new ways of combusting hydrocarbons. So instead of taking coal and burning it in ambient air to make steam to, to run a, a rank and cycle tur uh, um, uh, power plant, you can use solid oxygen carriers that combust with, with coal and you get a, the, the byproduct is, is, uh, is pure CO2. So you don't have to put money into separating it because the way you're burning, the way that you're combusting the hydrocarbon to make electricity, the byproduct of that, instead of being a bunch of flue gas that you have to take the CO2 out of, you get pure CO2. And then you can put that straight into a pipeline and, and inject it in the, into either a saline aquifer or uh, a, uh, <coughs> an, an oil, a depleted oil field. A, a longer uh, answer than you probably asked for, but I, I like talking about that stuff. <laughs> um, I'm probably getting the hook here. I'm, I'm <laughs> not quite. I'm going to okay. ask the last question. Okay. I'm going to ask the second last question. I'm the last, so you get the second one. All right. Um, you mentioned that you, you learned so much throughout, um, through your careers, you learn as you go. But um, looking back, what do you think some of the, the biggest skills um, that one can learn at our age, or, and looking back, um, might have been valuable for you to learn at an earlier time even? Um, gosh, you know. So, I mean, lots of skills that are useful. I mean, one, one thing that, you know, the that I think was was important for me is that it's it's easy to get impatient about what's next and try to figure out your path. But if 
if you're really focused at being good at the thing that you're staring at right now, um, that has more value than you probably realize, right? Um, and that's probably something I, I wish I would have done a little bit more at certain points in my career. Because, you know, oh, well, this isn't me, I need to, like, what am I gonna do next? And, but, like, the thing that you're doing now is the most important thing, because that's the only thing that there is, is the thing that you're doing right now. So, you know, focusing on, on, on what, you know, what's in front of you at the moment, and, you know, you have to have some situational awareness and think about kind of how the world works, but, you know, the, everything that you're doing teaches you something. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to appreciate the thing that you're learning in the moment, because you don't really know how this could be useful for you in your next thing, because you don't know what the next thing is. Um, but, I mean, and it, it's actually, that's easy advice to give to this, uh, uh, to this audience, because you're all going to be doing, you're doing terrific things now, you're in a terrific place, uh, you've got these incredible learning opportunities, and, and that will create real, that will create great opportunities for you in the future. So, yeah, I mean, I, that would be the, the one thing I, 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 if I could have done, which I did sometimes, I didn't always do, um, but if, if, uh, uh, if there's one thing I'd, I'd encourage you to do is, is know that you know, the, the now is actually really important and the things that you're learning right now are more important than you, than you might even realize. That was a better question than mine, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's not going to stop me from asking mine. There, there is a, uh, something you uh, mentioned which raises a really important issue that's universal, which is decision-making under risk. All right. So this carbon capture project with uh, uh, NRG is a good example. Uh, that's very risky. All right. It could wind up being a complete failure economically. All right. Yet there was this major public investment in it, like Cylinder. All right. And in this day of uh, hyper-partisan politics, you know you're going to get beat up uh, over it if that happens. Uh, Sure, this is no, I know it's not a new thought to you. And I'm guessing that was part of the decision making, part of the process you went through in deciding to go forward with this carbon capture project. Right. Say something about that. I mean, how, do you, yeah. how do you weigh the risks and factors like that? So, um, part of this will be a theoretical answer because much of what I'm much of what I'm managing and much of what one manages in a job like mine, you inherit. So I showed up and said, okay, here's your portfolio, and some of it's on fire, right? And some of it's doing great, so, and, and it's all yours, right? So, so and, and, that, and that, that disclaimer, I, I, you can't use, because it's all yours. It doesn't matter if you start it, you, you just own it. Like, all right, this is yours, and it's all yours. But, um, but overall, I like thinking about these things. So that, that's one of the tough things about managing technology in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the in the, in the public sector, is that you're supposed to be working on things that companies don't want to work on. I mean, if companies want to work on it, then stop working on it. Like someone's already, because if there's something that Exxon really wants to do that has to do with any of this stuff, they, they will do it better than we do. They got lots of money and they pay very high salaries and they, they, they're, they're really good at what they do. So I don't want to be doing something that Exxon is right in the middle of, right? Um, I don't want to be doing something that's in the middle of GE's profit model because they're really good at doing that stuff. Which means we have to do stuff that we identify as having some big positive externality that's good for the public, that's good for our economy, but which companies for whatever reason don't want to do. Right? Either there's not a regulatory driver for it yet or you know, in terms of risk tolerance it's beyond the risk tolerance of companies or the profit uh, horizon, because when I'm working for a company, I'm thinking about this quarter, right? So the nature of what we do is that we have to do stuff that is risky. It's the early research. Um, much of it does fail. And you know, well, how do you, you know, how do you deal with that? Uh, because you know, a lot of stuff that we do, you end up stopping because it doesn't work. If you're doing a project, you know, some of the projects, you know, the 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 reason why you have, for example, a loan guarantee program in the Department of Energy is that you want to push financing into those projects that banks want finance. But you know that in, in terms of the U.S. economy and, and U.S. energy security and the welfare of, of our nation, that they're important. So you want to be doing those things that are, are the banks don't want to do, but you say this stuff is actually important. Uh, which means that a certain percentage of those aren't 
going to fail. I mean, in fact, if none of them are failing, it means you're just poaching money away from <coughs> banks, right? You're, you're funding stuff that banks would fund without you being there. Um, so that's just a message that, message that we have to continue to communicate clearly. Right? You, it, we have to be articulate about the, what we succeed in, and we have to be articulate about the things that we fail in. And you know, how do you do it in this political environment? Well, you know, there's, you know, overall, if I look at our portfolio, you know, because I mean, I mentioned the NRG project. There's another project that I didn't mention called, you know, the the Kemper project in in, in Mississippi. That uh, you know, and and I, I see a couple of nodding heads, right? So, the, I mean, that's a project that is is way over budget, right? Um, because there's new technology, right? And there's some real challenges to it. But you know, if if you're articulate about the mission, and you you can show why you're working on why you're working on. And that you're you're working hard at communicating with stakeholders across the the uh, you know across the spectrum. You know it doesn't always work, and listen, you're always you're always set up to get to beat get beat up when you have something that doesn't that doesn't succeed. Um, but you know our job is to kind of be courageous as as decision decision makers, and um, you know it's it's not always not always easy to do. Good answer, yeah. Chris. Thank you so much for your wonderful public service and leadership, and thank you for sharing it with us today in such an engaging, inspiring way. It was terrific. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.